This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. I started this podcast about three years ago because I wanted to reach out to those of you who are already interested in emotional and psychological issues, to those of you who've recently been diagnosed with something that you're looking for answers for, and then for those of you who might never darken the door of a therapist or you never think you would, but you're curious you may be hurting, and you're looking for answers. There is so much misinformation and stigma about mental health treatment out there. This is a good place, I hope, that you can find out what it might really be like. So welcome to any and all of you. Let me first say today how much I enjoy hearing from you through your emails to me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com. I feel like I get to know you just a little. I know who listens to this podcast, obviously. I know your age groups. I know your interests and your problems and your struggles. So today, even though I have pretty recently did an episode on your questions, my answers, I decided today that I needed to do some catching up and answer some of your emails publicly that I've answered privately, and a couple I didn't get to answer privately. In fact, there are more and more of those, so please, if you've written to me, give me a chance The book Perfectly Hidden Depression comes out November the 1st, and I've been a bit swamped with requests from websites, etc. It's a wonderful problem to have, don't get me wrong, but it's taking up a lot of my time. So I'm answering your emails today, and the topics are diverse. The first is from a man whose dreams haven't been fulfilled, and he's almost totally given up that dream and is escaping through alcohol. The second is from a woman who's trying to make a decision about revealing past sexual abuse. The third is from a man who's realizing that a lot of his anxiety comes from feeling like he's always disappointing other people. And the last is from a woman who's married, but the cycle she and her husband are in sounds as if it's rapidly becoming more and more volatile and violent. And she asks me what she should do. The air date for this episode is October the 18th. I can't believe that that's only two weeks again before Perfectly Hidden Depression comes out. If you want it now, you can order it from New Harbinger Publications, and they'll send it right to you. But otherwise, I think the people who pre-ordered are receiving their copies, but please feel free to put in your order for a book or an e-book. It's not available right now in audio form, but hopefully it will be. You know, I've made it my steadfast goal not to sell you things or have advertisement on self-work. But this book I'm very proud of, and really its exercises, and there are 62 of them, can be used with anyone. I wrote the book about perfectionism, but the exercises I use in the book are actually ones I use with everyone. So it's available to you on Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, or at your local bookstore. Don't forget them. So let's sit back and relax and talk about some of these very diverse issues that you, my listeners, have sent to me. One of the great things that I love about doing this podcast is getting your emails So we're going to read some of those today. This one is from a man whose dreams weren't fulfilled. Here goes. I know one of the motifs I hear in your podcasts is encouraging people to overcome their fear and self-consciousness to seek out a mental health professional. My problem isn't the action. My problem is that there are either none available or they decline me because my insurance doesn't compensate them enough, despite they're listed on my Blue Shield website as accepting new patients and part of my network. Let me tell you a little of my story. I'm in higher management for a school where, in addition to teaching, I manage multiple faculty members and oversee education initiatives. My bosses are demanding and unappreciative, and I feel that I get blamed when anything goes wrong. 
I have two degrees, one in dance performance and my MBA. I started as a performer and did very well, but I hated the artist income. So I turned to business. Now I do both. My job has created such a negative connotation with dance, however, that I no longer even want to move. I moved here from Maine a few years ago for my relationship. I've been diagnosed with bipolar 2 and have some generalized anxiety. I'm on medicine that has kept me moderately stable, but now have fallen into a depression. My job has eaten me alive, and problems within my relationship have ended up pushing us to take a break. I've become very detached from my family back home and friends, and haven't had much opportunity to make friends here. But I've fallen apart. The medicine has me alive just enough that I'm not having suicidal ideation. I have two attempts behind me, but nothing within the past five years. But I only have so much emotional and mental energy by the time I've finished my day that I haven't had the ability to face my feelings of inadequacy, to apply to new jobs, or feel optimistic. I drink alcohol all the time now and have gone completely numb. And I like it that way a little bit, actually. It's easier to get through my days. This is why your podcast has been such a blessing for me. Your soothing voice helps calm me down on my drives to and from work. You can certainly hear the pressure and the responsibility this man faces, and he's not getting any kind of affirmation from his supervisors, a situation, sadly, that a lot of you are probably in. There are so many people that don't know how to manage people. And you can hear also the different levels of his problems, both at work, in his relationship, and now with substances. He also is having problems finding a therapist, and that's something I'm going to address in this response to him. Hello, thank you so much for your kind words. I'm glad you wrote in, and I'm sorry that you're having such distinct problems with finding a therapist. First, pragmatically, you can check with Blue Cross Blue Shield, but if they say they're accepting new patients and then don't because of money, that's not ethical. I don't know if you have actual evidence of that or if that's just the feeling you get. Many therapists don't accept insurance now, which I personally think is a shame. However, they'll give you the information that you need to file with your own insurance and hopefully at least obtain out-of-network monies. The other idea is to contact Blue Cross Blue Shield and ask them for specific referrals. Or perhaps you could ask the person who's prescribing your medication for you to be of some help. Or maybe there's a community mental health center somewhere nearby where your medication could be assessed. Even online talk therapy would be better than nothing, simply to give you a place for someone to listen and act as a support. As far as the rest of things go, there are several things I'm concerned about. First, your deepening depression, although on medication. Two, the drinking that will only make the depression worse. Three, you're isolating more from everyone. And four, and these were in no particular order, your unhappiness and exhaustion with work. If you've had two previous suicide attempts, then you obviously need to take all of these very seriously. I'm glad the podcasts are helping, but please advocate for yourself. Perhaps you need to find an AA support group if you can't get control of the drinking. And I would encourage you, instead of picking up a drink, you pick up, very slowly and with tenderness, your dance. That's where your soul is, and you're not connecting with it. Please keep searching and take very good care. He wrote me back, actually, and told me that he had done just that and that he had looked into substance abuse treatment, that he'd contacted his insurance company. So all of that was very good. We can turn to substances for escape, but they can easily, easily become the problem. Here's an email about sexual abuse and talking about it. She begins... I know I'm a complete stranger, and I don't know how many of these emails you may actually receive. I can't even imagine. I don't know the right thing to say here, except I need help. I stumbled onto an article you wrote in 2015, Six Reasons to Reveal Childhood Sexual Abuse. I came across it during a constant Google search battle, How to Confront Family About Childhood Sexual Abuse. I've been struggling to come to terms with it all my life, and because of a recent uproar, Keeping it a secret has become more self-destructive than ever. How do I do it? What do I even start off with saying? Your article gave me a little comfort knowing it's normal to feel how I feel. 
and it's the first article I've come across where I can feel like I can connect. I hope this reaches you. You can hear her confusion, her loneliness, her fear. And actually, this is a very hard thing to do and has to be done extremely carefully. So I write her back. I'm so sorry this has happened to you in the first place, and I understand how confusing it can be to try to decide what to do. I'll start by guiding you to a podcast that I did a bit ago, but addresses exactly the questions you may have, and that was episode 81 for any of you who want to listen. However, this is a decision with often lots of ramifications. I'd make sure that you're either going over things with a trusted friend or another therapist before you do so. Your family's reaction could be so diverse, and each member's reaction response different as well, so you have to be prepared for any and all of them. That was the sum and substance of my response to her, but I will tell you basically what we talked about in episode 81. I worked with a young woman named Candy many, many years ago. In fact, I was still in graduate school, and she wanted to do this very thing. She wanted to confront a grandfather about his sexual abuse of her. And we talked about it and talked about it, and I thought we'd gone over everything we needed to go over and that she was highly prepared. And then she went, and she came back a mess because she had gone with an agenda. And what I mean by that is that she had gone believing that if she confronted him, he would have remorse and shame and he would apologize. And that is not what happened, not in the least. He derided her. He demeaned her more. He teased her and made fun of her. It was mortifying to her and re-victimized her. So when you think about confronting a parent, a grandparent, anyone really, about being abusive to you, please realize that one of the things you want to make sure of is that your choice to do so is because you want to tell them something. You need to tell them something but you have to work through the various responses you might get because it can be very much what you don't want to hear. Here's the third email. I wanted to start off by saying that I appreciate the work that you do. I listen to many podcasts to supplement my own therapy, and self-work is one of my favorites. Thank you so much. I came across self-work because I was trying to make sense of the rut I'd been in. My life was the picture of perfection, and to everyone in my life, I seemed happy, motivated, confident, but I was drowning. Around this time, I started self-harming and having suicidal thoughts. I got into therapy, but I needed more support because I didn't have the confidence to accomplish much in therapy at the start. So, I listened to podcasts. What a great idea, by the way, to sort of bolster her confidence. One of the things I've come to realize is that a lot of the negative self-talk and self-hate comes from an intense feeling of disappointment. Any choice I make, anything I do, I assume that I'm completely disappointing the people I love. It is paralyzing and sends me into a shame hellstorm. It's not that I personally feel like a disappointment or that I'm not making the right choices for me. It's that what I know I need doesn't match up with my perception of other people's expectations. Curious your thoughts on the difference in perceived expectations versus reality and how to overcome that. Thank you for the work you do. Your work came into my life at a moment where I was very vulnerable and gave me hope. Well, there's nothing I could hear that's better than that. (laughs) Giving people hope and us all learning from one another is what self-work is all about. So here's my answer. Sounds as if you're working hard on trying to figure things out and make changes. There is something I'd suggest you look into. Try Google searching socially prescribed perfectionism or the research of Dr. Gordon Flett. That's F-L-E-T-T. He and others have found that when your perfectionism comes from always feeling as if you're not meeting the expectations of others, of constantly feeling as if you have to do more and more to please, that that's the most dangerous kind of perfectionism to struggle with. Whether you're projecting your own perfectionism onto others or it's actually a fact that since you've done very well, others do expect more and more of you. That's what's called socially prescribed perfectionism. And knowing more about that could lead you into the direction you need to go. The first would be to confront your own projection. Realize, I'm putting this on these people. 
they're fine with what I'm doing. If the problem is the second, where you're feeling like you have to ramp up and ramp up and ramp up to meet the expectations of others, then you can begin to set more rational and appropriate boundaries. You can say no, for example, or I need more time, or that's something I'll have to have help to do. You have to find a way to be assertive and to not constantly feel like even your best has to be better than it was last time. You know, I'm more than a bit of a perfectionist myself. I have a lot of trouble in saying no, in saying I need more time, in asking for help, all of those things, and many of those things I've shared with you. You know, there's so much discussion and focus on how social media is impacting us, and I think this is one area especially that you can feel like you wrote a post or you posted a picture or you did something on Instagram and it got a lot of likes or seemed to accrue a lot of views. And then the next thing you do doesn't get that much and you can actually feel down about it. Like somehow or another, it's less than or you're less than. I have to laugh because I do this myself. We recently changed the way we distribute the podcast and it's caused a decrease in the actual numbers And I'm really struggling with, oh, no, is the podcast not doing well? And the podcast is doing fine. It's doing great. It's my perfectionism. So if you struggle with this, then maybe you can look up Dr. Flett's work or socially prescribed perfectionism. Hopefully it's helpful. So here's the fourth and last email. Dr. Rutherford, I'm 26 and married with an 8-year-old son and a 4-year-old daughter, both fathered by my husband. I was pregnant with my son as well as still in high school when we were wed. However, I knew he was the one. I still knew he was the one, even after finding out he had sex with a friend of mine two weeks before our wedding. A few months after we were married and my son was born, the girl he had sex with moved very close to us. I never assumed, accused, stalked, or anything else to try and find out if he was talking to her. I mean, if it was going to happen, it was going to happen, and there was nothing I could do about it. Well, sure enough, one morning she contacted me and felt the need to tell me that they were still talking and having sexual encounters. I wanted to leave. He begged and pled and swore, just like he did on our wedding day, that he would never speak to her again. Long story short, I stayed. Believe it or not, I'm over it. Over it, over her, over the betrayal, over the whole situation. I actually wish our relationship problems were still that simple. We moved to a new home and began a new chapter in our lives when we brought our daughter into the world four years ago. My husband works from eight to five. He often doesn't tell me when he gets off early in fear of me asking a favor or a request. If I just happen to ask him how work was, after the evening is winding down, he'll say, oh, I didn't have to go in today. On one of the occasions, he stayed home and didn't tell me. I even had to leave our sick son at a grandparent's house because I couldn't send him to school. My husband stays busy and away from the house as much as possible. His busyness is about hobbies, and really, he lives by his own agenda. When we try and sit down and talk, I often get overwhelmed. If I'm being completely honest, it feels like I'm being attacked, and I lose every ounce of knowledge I have on how to defend myself. My words are used against me, so I have to be very careful with how I word them. I try to explain to him why I feel like I'm getting the bad end of the deal when it comes to our life together, but I can never get him to understand. I don't know if even I understand. Even sitting here writing this to you, I barely have any examples to give you because it's almost like I block them out of my head in order to be able to continue to go on. Things have gotten physical, and if I'm being honest, I am mainly the one that hits first. He taunts me and says he doesn't have to get out of my personal space if he doesn't want to, and he will stand behind me breathing on my neck for what seems like hours while I'm pleading with him to leave me alone. His abuse is more emotional because he knows he's more powerful with that kind of abuse. My kids have always been asleep or not home when this happens. I don't want to be this person. I know that it's wrong. A few days after our last confrontation, which was one of the worst, he told me, it's like you want someone to hit you and beat you up. He accuses me of things he knows aren't true. I can show him proof of it not being true, and it's like the proof isn't good enough for him, or he just chooses not to acknowledge it. He's also had thoughts and threatened self-harm before. During our last physical confrontation, 
The end was hearing the door slam, and he went outside, and then hearing the blast of a gun. I immediately got up and ran outside while trying not to throw up. I found him standing by the bed of his pickup truck with his pistol in his hand. I asked him what he was doing, and he said nothing to go back inside. I'm honestly not sure what was said or done after this, but I eventually got him to come back inside, and we went to bed. She goes on to describe violence, actually, that she saw between her parents, ending in her own mother dying. She ends with, Each conversation I have with him regarding our relationship, I am left feeling so defeated, interrupted, worthless, stupid, and most importantly, crazy. So I guess my question is, am I the mentally unstable one? Am I the primary problem in the relationship? Thanks from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to read this. I hope to hear back from you. Wow. This listener is describing such chaos. And they are fighting about what is right and what is wrong. And so many of us therapists believe if you want to fight that fight, go ahead. But you might as well go on and file for divorce. And obviously, things are getting more volatile. So this is my response to her. First, let me say I'm sorry that it's taken me this long to get back with you. And thank you for being a listener. If you don't already know it, you're playing with fire. Things are escalating between the two of you, and the volatility is increasing. That is not a good pattern. And in fact, research shows that that pattern will continue. People think, oh, if it gets worse, we'll stop. But that's not what happens with abuse. Once a line is crossed, it's much easier to cross the line again. You can become accustomed and even addicted to this kind of chaos, all the while hiding it while you go to work and take care of your kids, while he's not carrying his share of the responsibility. Please recognize that this is a situation that is serious and needs a serious solution. Both of you are acting in ways that are both self-harmful, volatile, and highly intense. You feel as if you have to prove that your point is valid or your memory correct. But then you take the bait when he doesn't agree or demeans you. This is toxic, very toxic. You may have love for him. It's love and respect for yourself that's missing. You grew up in a violent and chaotic home. And even you state you feel some kind of guilt for the violence that occurred in your home, as if as a child you could have stopped it. You say, I still knew he was the one, even after finding out he had sex with a friend of mine two weeks before our wedding. He was showing signs of not respecting you then, and that has only increased. It's really the same problem. And you are growing in the violence of your response to not being valued. I don't believe that you want him to beat you up, physically or emotionally, but you are likely to get triggered very easily by signs of his disrespect because of anger you've had around for years. I definitely recommend that you go to a woman's shelter for advice or counseling or a therapist in your own area who knows what's available to you. Your own anger and sense of helplessness is growing, as is his emotional reactivity. There's very little trust, if any, and your arguing could go on and on and end in tragedy. Please act in your behalf and the behalf of your children. You know, in this situation, I didn't go necessarily into a lot of talk about gaslighting or narcissism or selfishness or self-centeredness or sociopathic behavior because I really felt like what I needed to do was to make sure that this woman heard me loud and clear that things could easily get worse. And they could. I hope that if any of you listening have a problem like this, that you'll also take that message very seriously. I remember a woman I worked with who was questioning her decision to leave her ex-husband, who was also very abusive. She was regretting it. Her children missed their father. Her life was not necessarily what she wanted it to be. So one weekend when the children were gone, I had her call her friends and her family over for a big bowl of soup and had her ask them, what was it? Why did I leave? What did I talk to you about? What did you hear from me? And she came back with three or four pages of solid lines and crying because she said, I had forgotten all this. The part of this patient's email that talks about that she shuts out these memories, that is denial working. That is dissociation working. 
and it can be very numbing, and you don't want that. You've got to realize the danger that you are in, and you actually can be part of creating. So please, if this is you, try to get some perspective and some clarity. Thanks again for listening to Self Work. We're going to be making a few changes. The podcast design will be a little bit different, so I hope you enjoy just trying to freshen things up a little bit. Email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. And don't forget, there's a new way to leave me a message on SpeakPipe. You can find it on my website at drmargaretrutherford.com, where you can leave me a voice message. I love that. Also, while you're there, subscribe to my website, and that way you receive a weekly newsletter with the podcast and a blog post for the week, plus a personal note, just to let you know how much I appreciate your presence. Thank you for the ratings and reviews, especially the written reviews give me so much information. I more than appreciate them and ask that those of you who perhaps have not, leave me one. Constructive criticism is also welcome. So thanks for being here. I look forward to next week. Take very good care. This is Dr. Margaret, and you've been listening to Self Work.